Hallelujah. Okay, Romans 12, starting in verse 3. Romans 12, starting in verse 3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. There it is. There's the one another. Right there at the end in verse 5. And each member belongs to all the others. Hallelujah. I'd like to show you a quick picture. So this is one body, many parts, right? One body, many parts, many members. There you go, right? It's a chicken. One body, many parts, many members. Now, what happens, though, if we get this? <laughs> There's many parts, but they've been dismembered. It's no longer a living body, brothers and sisters. And this is the point that I think that the Apostle Paul is really trying to get at, that we as the body of Christ are a living, breathing organism. We are a, we are a unified body. And, th and, and this, whoops, sorry, this is what it means to have a living body with many members. Okay, so a couple of things I just want to share, uh, just fleshing out the, the verses. Uh, first in verse 3, Paul, I love how he starts. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, Paul felt a very special calling to do what he was doing. You know, and of course, some of us, we know the story of Paul, right? He was first a terrorist. He was a religious terrorist, terrorizing the church. He was killing Christians. And of course, he had that dramatic encounter with the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. And what happens, right? He's blinded, and then he has to go and wait, and he's got to wait on someone to come to him. And, and Ananias, right, he comes to him, and, 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 and a powerful encounter again. He, his sight returns. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. And then he feels commissioned, right, by Jesus himself to be an apostle to the Gentiles. So he felt a very special calling. He knew his calling. He was convinced, for by the grace given me, and I, again, I love the way he put it, the grace given me. It's not that he earned it. It's not that he was skilled at it. It's not, it's, you know, it's not, had nothing to do with qualifications and even talks about how qualified he could be in the worldly sense, but it was only by God's grace that he is doing what he's doing. And that goes the same for you and me. You know, and I love, you know, occasionally I'll have conversations with, with somebody and we're talking about uh, here in Cranford and I am absolutely convinced that Christ called Grace and I to Cranford. I am absolutely, there is no question in my mind, no doubt whatsoever, we're about to celebrate six years here, uh, April 1st, so that's no joke. But we feel absolutely called to be part of this local body of believers. And brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you, you need to have that same conviction as well. Now Paul goes on to say, in verse 3, right? And some, some scholars have debated about what he actually meant, but he goes on to say in verse 3, you know, think of yourself with sober judgment. And again, if we think about the context, remember the church in Rome, some of you may remember me sharing about this before, it was a mixture. It was both Jew and non-Jew. And they were starting to kind of look at each other a little weird. And, and they were saying, you know, well, you're not, you're not like me, and so you're, you're less than me. Uh, and, and so there was some division about starting to happen. And so Paul's saying, hey, remember, it's, first of all, it's by grace. 
and think of yourselves with sober judgment. And then he says this, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. What does he mean? Then? What does he mean? According to the faith that God has... So does it mean that some of us have been given greater faith? Some scholars would say that that's what he was meaning. You know, that there's different levels of faith. You know, for example, at, right after this, he goes on to talk about spiritual gifts, right? So maybe for, for the gift of, of preaching, there's a certain level of faith. Maybe for the gift of, of, of serving, it's a different level of faith. Maybe for the, for the gift of encouraging, it's a different level of faith. Uh, I think that he could possibly be meaning that as well, but I want to be careful because when we get there, then we get to places where we say, well, maybe you didn't have enough faith. And that can be a very dangerous place to be. But one of the things I definitely uh, agree that he was saying, when he's saying to think of ourselves with sober judgment according to the faith uh, that God has distributed to each of us, we've all been given a certain level of faith, the same faith. We, bought, we all have the, the, the faith given to us to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We all have that same faith to believe that God vindicated Christ, rising him from the dead. We all have that same level of faith. And so rather than like a, 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 a cup, a measuring cup of faith. Oh, how much faith do you have? Well, this is how much faith I have. No. Rather than that kind of measurement, we look at, at, at the measure of faith as, as, as a measuring stick instead. And Christ is that measuring stick of faith that you and I to think, are to think of ourselves with sober judgment. You follow me? Because when Christ is the measuring stick, which he should be, of the measure of our faith, then we can adequately, confidently, and soberly consider ourselves when we put ourselves against that standard of measurement. And besides, that's the only one that matters. And that is, that is the, uh, I believe, what Paul is really getting at there. In accordance with the faith that God has driven. Brothers and sisters, uh, our faith is supernatural. Amen. It's a miracle. <laughs> and so the very fact that you and I even believe, again, that is a, uh, that is a gift of God's grace given to us, right? Faith. That is the standard of measurement that we are to use. Okay, now we're going to get in here into, into where I really want to go, right? Verse 5. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. In Christ. You know, those are the two most important words in the whole Bible. In Christ. You and I are now in Christ. When we come to faith in, Christ, in Jesus, we are in Christ. God looks at you and me in Christ. There's a whole new reality of you and I in Christ, and especially when we come together as, as a community. But then he says, each member, right? He goes on to say that. So in Christ, we though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. First we'll say each member, right? What Paul is saying there, it's almost like if, he were, if, he, if Paul were here standing, he'd be pointing at you. Every one of you, each one of you, that's, 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 the, that's the idea he's going for. Each one of you, like he's doing a head count, one by one, each one of you, brothers and sisters, that call Cranford Alliance Ch uh, Church your home, your family, your community of faith, each one of you, brothers and sisters, are a member. Now, you know, some people have asked me, hey, how do I become a member? And yes, we do have that. And, you know, hopefully sometime soon we'll have another membership class come up and you'll get to learn things like the history of the Alliance and our movement. And, and amen, yes, it was, you know, eight people around a wood stove. They were poor, they were cold. And it was eight people led by A.B. Simpson, who at the time as a Presbyterian minister left his, his lucrative pastorate. I mean, uh, in today's terms, he was easily making a six-figure income. <laughs> 
in a very well-to-do Presbyterian church. And he gave all that up because he felt God's call to be on mission, especially to the immigrants that were coming into New York City. And with that eight, right, they now we're a, a worldwide fellowship of over six million Alliance believers. And even our very own church, Cranford Alliance Church, right, officially we became a, a church in 1905. And very similarly, uh, we started the same way. It was a small group of women. Amen. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it started as a Bible study. And, um, oh, the name escapes me now. What's, what's the name of the woman? Is it Mildred? It starts with an M. Uh, it's one of those old names. Oh, forgive me. Uh, anyway, uh, the, the woman that God had started, she went and heard A.B. Simpson in New York City and quickly caught on, and she actually uh, was part of the, the, the executive committee of, uh, of the Alliance in New Jersey. She was, I think, officially the secretary uh, for a while, and she was known as the superintendent of the branch at Cranford. And so look where we are today. And my hope is maybe even within a year we're going to uh, plant another church as well. But, you know, think of all of the, uh, of, uh, of all of the members that, that have helped to keep this local body of Christ going. Of course we believe it's the Holy Spirit. But it's because each one felt that conviction of the grace given to them that they were part of this local body of Christ. So each member, and here's, the, and member, right? Again, like I said, we're, you know, the, yes, we do have sort of this official membership process, but what Paul is getting at as a, a member, each one of us is a body part. Each one of us is a part of the body. And of course, right, uh, he fleshes it out in 1 Corinthians 12 uh, in more detail, right? And in fact, I'll, I'll share a couple of passages from that. In 1 Corinthians 12 is, a, is probably the, the, the second place uh, where he, he also goes into great detail with the body analogy. And in 1 Corinthians 12, you know, he says, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Right? And then he goes on and, go, and, and continues to give uh, detail and explanation. And you know, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And then he goes on to say, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And, and it, if one part suffers, every part suffers. And then here's the goal. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you make up the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Brothers and sisters, a couple of points that I want to make. First of all, is this. We are truly members of one another. We are truly members of one another as the body of Christ when our diversity is the reason for our unity. Okay, when, our, when our diversity is the reason for our unity, as we depend on one another. Okay, and, and let's be honest, right? Uh, we're, oftentimes in the natural, we're tempted, right? Uh, your difference bothers me. I don't like to be around different people. Hey, all right. You're, you, you, we look at difference as, as a challenge. Let's be honest. We look at difference as something that we have to overcome. And really, when you look at the body, right? And man, I mean, I don't have to, I mean, maybe I could ask Dr. Pepper to come. I mean, the body is, is an amazing creation of God. And how it all works together is, I mean, that's a miracle. And it's because of the diversity that the body can function. It's because of it, not in spite of it. 
And so, brothers and sisters, we are truly members of one another as the body of Christ when our diversity is the reason for our unity as we depend on one another. One of the strongest examples I can give of this, brothers and sisters, is how we worship. Okay? And maybe some of us are familiar with the worship wars of the 90s in churches and, you know, and, and uh, you know, many books have been written on this and, uh, uh, y you know, uh, and I look at our church and, and don't get me wrong, um, uh, worship of God uh, is not about us. It's about Jesus. It's not about what you like and what I like. It's about what God likes. All right? So, uh, so let's, let's make sure that we understand that. Let's also make sure that we understand that um, the, only, the only reason why God is pleased with our worship is because Jesus has made the way. That is the only reason. It's not because of how good we've been. It's not because of, of uh, or, how, or uh, how good the music sounds. Uh, it's not because of, of where a particular candle is placed or a flower or, uh, you know. Uh, but one of the things that I really value, brothers and sisters, and I hope some of you have gotten to know this, is I value diversity. I really do. I believe it is the strength of the kingdom of God. When we can be a fellowship of difference, Scott McKnight would say. And so, yeah, I, you know, some, uh, some people come and, and uh, I remember, you know, because we, we send out an email to newcomers and we say, hey, you know, we'd look, like some feedback. And, and uh, I, you know, a couple of times people will say, well, I didn't really like, I didn't really like the music. Or I said, well, come back next week. It'll be different. <laughs> Uh, but see, here's the thing, right? And, and, and this is the point that I'm trying to make. When we celebrate the diversity that is inherently among us, Jesus is glorified. When we stop seeing it as, as, as a challenge and uh, as, as something that we have to get over or uh, uh, to, to, to get past in spite of, then, then we miss out on the glorious beauty and, and, and color of the kingdom of God. Now here's the thing we need to remember. Unity does not mean uniformity. Okay? So, you know, um, uh, you, know you get uniformity in the military, right? Uh, but uh, again, one body, many members, working together. All right? And there's an interdependence there, right? There's, there's a, a mutual submission. I, uh, some of you may remember Pastor Joe DeSantis, my friend who came, and he said, uh, uh, love is what life is all about. That was his main point. Love is what life is all about. And again, using the body analogy, right? He says, you know, he's using the muscles, right? Like when the, when the, when the, when the, when the bicep flexes, the tricep relaxes. And when the tricep flexes, the bicep relaxes. And there's, there's this mutual submission to one another, right? The bicep is not, hey, I got I to gotta get, yeah, get up there. And the tri, you know, you know, there's no competing. You know, one willingly, you know, lets the other forward when, when the time is right. And so here's another thing that we need to remember as well, right? That, that no one is more important to God than another, and here's the point, that, again, that he's trying to make. You know, we're all members of, uh, of one body, right? And, 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 uh, and so, you know, and he even says uh, later on in some other passages talking about weaker and stronger. And, you know, uh, in Corinthians, he talks about, you know, uh, those uh, that require special honor and those kinds of things. But the main point is this. There is no one more important part of the body to God, So I'm not more important than either one of you before God as a part of this body. And think about that where Paul is saying that. I mean, that was, that, I mean, that was, that was explosive 
Because, you know, especially in that day and age, I mean, there was a clear de definition, and even today in some places, right, there's a clear delineation between, between the priesthood and the laity, right? And Paul's saying, hey, every one of you is part of the body. Every one of you is necessary. Every one of you is a body part. Each one of you is essentially uh, of worth and value. It doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe there's different responsibilities. Maybe some might have different functions and maybe some have more responsibilities than others. But each one of you as a part of the body is important. So what we see there, right? Diversity, unity, equality, all wrapped up in divine community. I mentioned Scott McKnight's book, right? A Fellowship of Difference. I love his, I love his metaphor. It's really cool. He, he uses the salad analogy. Let me just read a couple words from him. So, so his thesis uh, that the local church is to be made up of, of the people of God from all sorts of backgrounds. Okay? Right? This is the different parts. Different races, different ethnicities, different genders, different musical preferences and artistic preferences. Right? And, and then he says, well, how, 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 what's a good picture? What's a good metaphor? So uh, Scott McKnight comes up with the different ways that we prepare salad. Right? America's supposed to be a melting pot, right? I don't think we're really a melting pot, unfortunately. But even, actually, no, I won't say unfortunately, because this is, this is the point he's getting at. Listen to this. Here's the American way that we eat salad. Fill the bowl with lettuce or spinach leaves, then move on to tomato slices, carrots, cucumbers, whatever else one fancies. Finally, to top it off, the salad is smothered with a dressing of our preference. Like ranch. <laughs> All right, now here's the weird way to have salad. To separate each item of the salad around a plate and then proceed to eat them as separate items, those who prefer this method might even take a pass on the dressing. Right? Keep everything separate. Don't let it touch. And then according to McKnight, this is the right way to have a salad. Gather all the green ingredients together. Chop them into smaller bits. After that, cut up some, some, some other vegetables, tomatoes, carrots, onions, red peppers, uh, throw in some nuts. <laughs> we, you know, throw in some nuts. Dried berries. Romano cheese. And then, finally, drizzle some good olive oil over the salad. And I'd say even some vinegar. And voila, this somehow brings the full taste out of each item. So what he's trying to say here, brothers and sisters, at the, is that the church, the local church, our church, Cranford Alliance Church, we are God's world-changing social ex experiment. Let me say that again. We are God's world-changing social experiment. And right, what did Jesus pray in John 17, right? He said, he was, before he's going to the cross, right? A lot of people say, you know, before you're about to go, uh, what you say are some of the most important things, Right? And here we have in John 17 is his prayer, right? God, make them one as you and I are one. By their, their love for one another, the world will know. And it's, it's when we come together as diverse as we are, as different as we are, differing personalities as we are. And we remember because of the grace given to each one of us, we think soberly of ourselves according to the measuring stick of Christ. And we say, I'm a part of this body. I'm a necessary part of this body. I'm needed in this body.
And each one of us has, has, has a function. And you know what? Well, uh, you know, uh, some statistics, they say like, you know, f- you know, 15% of the people in church do 85% of the work. Can you imagine if your body only functioned 15% of it, only functioned? You wouldn't, you wouldn't be healthy. Now imagine if 85% of the body was at work. Now here's another thing I want to say. Living things grow. Living things grow. Okay, so, uh, and, and again, when you saw that video clip of Jeff Vanderstelt talking about house churches, and he's saying, what's the very first identity statement? We're a family. And that's it, brothers and sisters, we're a family. And really where all of this gets played out is in smaller group community. That's really where these one another's really get fleshed out. It doesn't happen here. I mean, and again, I'll say it all, I'll say it forever and ever. What we do on Sunday morning is very important. We celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ until he comes again. But where the one another's really get fleshed out is when we get into close community with one another, where we get to experience the diversity in all its fullness in, 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 in all its, its, its beauty and, 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 and we strive for unity. That's really where it happens. And again, right, I'm going to challenge us. It's when we open ourselves to allow all of the diversity of God to mold us, to shape us. And so I, I, want, to ch- I want to really encourage us. Where can you start to become a more involved and active part in the body of Christ. Living things grow, right? Living things grow. And like we saw with the chicken, right? When, when, we're, when we're united, when we're recognizing we're part of the same body, we're alive, we're growing. But when we're not, then that's what we are, right? So what do we want to be, brothers and sisters? That's really what it boils down to. What do we want to be? Do we want to be alive and growing? United? There's some things that got to happen, right? For example, like one of the things I mentioned, right, is stop comparing, stop judging, right? If we're going to do some judging, let's judge ourselves to Christ. That's a good place to start. And I got to remember that too for my own kids. Man. I have high expectations for my children. And, and I got to remember, oh, that's right, they, they need just as much, they, they, they need just as much grace. Or my spouse, my neighbors, my coworkers, my friends. Let's stop judging. Let's embrace the diversity that we find ourselves. And this is another difficult thing for us, right? Let's be honest. Like I said, I'd rather be around people like me and who like me. It's hard being around people that are not like you. And, and that's in all different ways. Age, race, gender, ethnicity, personality. Where do we need to be a little bit uh, more aware? Oh, Yes. Diversity is God's design, right? And even within the Trinity, right? There's unity and diversity, equality, community, charity. There's love right there. You know what's on every coin? 
E pluribus unum. Do you know what that means? Out of the many, one. It's God's dream. Unity and diversity. Brothers and sisters, where do we need to, uh, to be more aware of that? Embrace the diversity. Stop judging. And get more engaged in this local body. Each one of you, brothers and sisters, I believe, uh, have been given spiritual gifts. Not for your own personal, spiritual, psychological enjoyment. But to what? To build up the body. And when you don't worship the Lord and serve the Lord in a local body of Christ that God has called you to, then not only do you miss out, but the body misses out as well. Where do you need to get more engrafted? I'll use another metaphor. Into the body of Christ. I want to challenge you. Sign up for a house church. Men, you know, there's the men's breakfast. Women, there's plenty of studies to join as well. There's the, the, the new running group that's starting. That's a great place to start. Where, where, uh, you know, I hate to, to sound like a commercial, but where could you get more involved in serving? I want to challenge you. Every one of you should be serving somewhere. And that kind of goes along with the whole expectations thing, right? I, mean, I kind of, I kind of chuckle, and I, I, I get it. I'm, not, I'm no judgment, right, Pepe? No judgment. I kind of chuckle when people come and they say, "Oh, I'm church shopping," like we're a consumer good on on the shelf at Trader Joe's or something. <laughs> I've even heard some people uh, liken churches to, to, you know, to, to to stores. We're like Trader Joe's. We're not like Whole Foods. We're like Trader Joe's. No, just kidding. <laughs> Um, and and, and I, again, I get it. I get it, right? And, you know, uh, to, in one sense of the word, you could look at church as a purveyor of religious goods and services, but that is not the biblical image of what the church is. And, 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 and anytime I get a, a chance to have a conversation with somebody who's checking us out, I say, have you asked God where he's calling you to serve? In, in, in the Hebrew, right, serve is also synonymous with worship. Because that's the most important thing. Has God called you to worship here? If so, then where are you serving? If so, where are you saying, all right, Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can encounter others in love, in all of the diversity, make us one, alive in the body of Christ. I want to challenge you. Take that step of faith.